now for your listening pleasure, here's Polizzi and Rose, covering the week of media, marketing, and digital content news. This old marketing. Take it away, boys. Hello, my friends. This is Robert Rose, and welcome to episode number 314, 314, the pie episode of This Old Marketing for March 10th, 2022. And with me, as always, my good friend, my colleague, and, well, let's just face it, a guy who didn't get a four-year, $200 million deal like Aaron Rodgers, Mr. Joe Polizzi. Did you see that? I did. I did see it. I didn't know if that was a sure thing. Because all I heard from the two sides was that a deal was done, but nobody would say whether or not that was the You know, deal. it's just the most it's the most typical and most annoying Aaron Rodgers thing ever in that he's like being so coy about the whole thing. It's like anybody you know, if somebody says something he's like, I don't know. Maybe it is <laughs> maybe, I'm maybe playing. it's not. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not. lying. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm vaxxed, maybe I'm not. You know? You're right, everything I mean, is so it's, up in the air. But I'm, he's just so, he's so Mr. Cool with his coyness. It's like, he's just annoying at this point. I mean, to be honest. Hey, I, I he mean, might be annoying, he's a great but player. I would totally take him as quarterback. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, you know, he I mean, be he annoying. is now. It's, it's the same thing that people feel yeah. about LeBron. Like, people were always like, ah, oh, you know, I can't stand LeBron and Showboat and whatever and the chosen one. But, hey, he can play for me anytime. That's right. I mean, you know, he is undoubtedly the, you know, with Brady gone, he's the best in the league. I mean, uh, and it's, I don't even think it's close, right? You know, I mean, people point to Mahomes and say he's fantastic, but, uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers is, is uh, right now, Aaron Rodgers well, is yeah, by with the, far with the best the, quarterback with in the, the league. Two MVP, recent MVPs, and with Brady gone, I mean, you had Brady because of all the championships, and then there's a huge gap. So with him gone, now you really have a conversation that you can have about best quarterback in the league because there's six or seven of them that could be up there. I mean, you could get, uh, you've got uh, what's Josh from uh, the Bills? I mean, he's. Well, Josh is amazing. I mean, Josh Allen. Josh is Allen, gonna be, yeah, he he's going to be a superstar. He's going to be right up there with it. And then, of course, you mentioned Mahomes, and then Russell Wilson. You know, going to to Denver, still in the conversation. Going to Denver, I think. yeah. I, I, uh, I I'm, I'm you not got sure. Kyler Murray from Arizona. Nope. Now, first of all, Ky- nope. Not hey. even no, nope. Kyler Murray is 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 2022's. Uh, Robert Griffin Jr. Yeah, and there so, are yeah. some hints to that. I must yeah. say that the play <laughs> was at the playoffs where he was falling backward in the end zone and then just flipped it, flipped the interception pick six. Yeah, and threw it right to the Rams who ran that was for a touchdown. Just, yeah, that, that hurt. I mean, that that could yeah. be a career defining episode for him. Either he's going to be amazing now, or he's just going to go Robert Griffith's way. If yeah, you will. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's unfortunate, but it's so weird. It's almost. I know it's three ten as we record this, but I was thinking, man, why couldn't we do three fourteen on three fourteen? That's so meta. We just, just that. <laughs> we should have well, just. We waited. could have. We we could have done this, but apparently you like have things to do. Like you have you have uh, you know you have you have special things that need to be taken care of. I know. I'm 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 busier. I'm busier than I had expected to be at this time of the year, but yeah. it's, it's okay. Oh, by the way, yeah, today, actually, we're celebrating it tomorrow on our Discord, but today is the one-year anniversary of TiltCoin. Well, congratulations that amazing? on that. That's amazing. We have 700, 1,799 coin holders. Wow. And I'm like, w- come on, I'm like, one more. Just get me to 1,800. Just... Get you just to eighteen hundred before the just get there. No, we're having a big old like I gave away a bunch on my newsletter today, and we've got a article in the tilt uh, newsletter tomorrow. And then what we're doing it's fun. Everybody's kind of excited about it. Basically, we're saying if you're in the Discord at any time tomorrow, we're gonna start just giving away all kinds of tilt coin. Like, for, but you gotta be on. So we're just gonna start flipping coinage. You're gonna. <laughs> it's gonna start. I, I can already see the making it rain. Just oh, we're gonna make it to rain happen. with fake money all yeah. over the yeah. place. <laughs> make it rain. 
<laughs> now, don't call it money, Joe. Don't, don't call, call it, it an investment. It, don't. It's not. Well, I mean, yeah. currency. You, we're calling it cryptocurrency. It's it's crypto money. It's yeah. Just it's just we can't say what we can't say is that you can actually make a profit off of it, which I did not That's say. Right. We cannot right. say that. Well, you kind of just no, did, no, no. But you, we, but you I'm didn't saying say we it, can't right? say it. You, so I'm not saying that. You can't say you can make a profit off of you it. You may think you can't you, say you cannot, that. Yeah, you cannot do that. It cannot is, say that. It is a membership. You can make a profit yeah, off it. It is yeah. a membership. <laughs> you have token. You get special benefits. Ah, uh, yes. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, so it's it's been fun kind of going through. I wrote the article reminiscing. It's so funny because it launched. You, well, anyways, I was going to talk about you for a second, but you can talk about you whenever you want to talk about you. But... Yeah. We, you know, as we're launched, we launched at 30 cents or something like that. And then um, the first time I saw it was at 66 cents. And now it's at 22, $23, depending on where this crypto bear market goes. But it, it is, it's amazing. It's, I, I'm surprised by the amount of loyalty and excitement that it causes in our little community where people think it's a, it's a good thing. And it is. Well, it is. Yeah, we've talked about and it. And I will. I, I will promise to talk about me very shortly. Yes, yes it's just. Um, You've been awfully you know. quiet on that front, and I'm waiting. I'm and your audience some is T's. waiting. Yeah, I'm crossing some T's. I'm dotting some I's. I'm. You know, I. I like to make sure that things are right before I go out. That's the understatement um, of the world. Uh, <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> just wait. It's not oh. quite there. It needs a little it, bit more polishing. Uh, yeah, it does. It does. It does, it does need six, a little more polishing. And then six years later. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. When I'm already too late. Five right? more it's seasons like I come out of Picard, and, and then, if, <laughs> then I'll be ready to launch. Did you see the first season? Did you see the first episode of Picard? Did you see how amazing it was? Do you see, do you <laughs> understand the level of excitement that I have for this series? All right. I do have a couple comments. First of all, I was not a Paramount Plus subscriber. Which I immediately rectified because I saw the first season of Picard. Absolutely loved it. I'm a, I'm not a Trekkie like you are, but I love Star Trek. And I got yeah. into it big time with the next generation. And of course, that's all about Jean I mean, Picard, Picard. Yeah, I mean Patrick Stewart. Picard is, yeah. Everything. Right. I loved it. So I was excited when Picard came out. And of course, season two, I'm all into it. First thing I want to mention is the Paramount Plus experience. Now you have the <laughs> well, you have yeah. the premier version, which is what eight bucks or nine months of bucks a month or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, you get limited yeah. commercials. Do you get commercials? No, like zero, zero commercials. commercials. Yeah, zero. Commercials. I must have to upgrade because I got the four dollar or four ninety nine. Yep, that's and right. And the commercial breaks during Picard were excruciating. It oh, I'm se- sure they, they were. seemed yeah. longer than network television. I'm like right, but isn't it only? I think it's only commercials about Paramount Plus, right? They're like in other words, you see other for the four dollars. I don't think you get like Tide Pods. Oh, I get all of I it. I think you get no, you get all. Oh, of you it. do. Okay, you all get right. everything. You get you get you get really silly commercials and like I don't know who signed this deal, but I'm watching all kinds of stupid stuff. I'm like, okay, that's fine. So I actually have to upgrade to your version so that I can go through. A full I just had to do that without... with Peacock because we're in the middle of Yellowstone and Yellowstone is unwatchable with commercials. It's just you you can't you, I mean you you'll it'll drive you mad um, if you have to deal with commercials. That I mean it's an intense show. I mean it's I've not watched Yellowstone. I've heard great things. Yeah. I love Kevin Costner. It's great. So it's the Sopranos in Montana is what oh, it is. It's like it's it's so I good. I should probably uh, I should probably yeah. watch that at some point. But okay, so here's my commentary on Picard and. And yeah. folks, for the next minute, spoiler alert, I'm just going to say one thing. Or okay. maybe I won't even say it. I'll just say, I'll just sort of insinuate it. All right. How about a new plot? How about, why do they always have to go back to two things? And I won't even, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. They're going to go back to the okay, Q, and they go back to the Borg. Whenever they don't have a story to tell, they go back to those two things with Jean-Luc. Why not okay. something different? Now I know for no, fan no, no. service purposes, it's amazing, right? Because that was always the best. You know, that was the 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 most famous of all of the situations that Jean Luc got in was with Q, and of course the end ending of the whole thing, and then the first contact was all with the Borg. No, first contact, um, the other one that they did 
ne- the next one of the movies was a whole board. Of movie. course. Yep. yep. Okay. So yep. that's my question to you. You are a Trekkie. You know this better than anyone yep. else. Don't you think that they maybe should have tried something different? Or is this just because this is the last Picard ever made and they're going out and they're they're not pulling any punches? I think a number of things here, right? So I do actually think that they're not going to do another season. Um, uh, if if they pay this off in the way that I think they're going to pay it off. Um, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see. I, if, if, to me, if, if this goes the way I think it's going to go, it would be really, really hard for them to make a season three that isn't somehow jumping the shark. Um, and so you might argue that if they wanted to do a season three, that this, that what they're going to do this season should have been season three. Um, if they wanted to make it sort of a trilogy. Yeah. Uh, however, having said that, one, yes, fan service. Two, the story arc here. Uh, the story, if you go back, you should, you know what you should do? Because I actually did this and it was wonderful. Go back and watch Journey to Farpoint, which was, of course, the pilot episode of Next Generation. Go, go back and watch Journey to Farpoint and, and it, it, and then, and then if you really want to geek out, go watch the, of course, the, the series well, finale. Well, that's what I watched the series finale so that I could watch the first episode of Picard. Well, then you're, you're caught up on the series finale. So if you go back and watch Journey to Farpoint, you know, you, you'll understand. I think that the, you know, the whole thing, you know, I mean, because you, uh, I don't want to give away spoilers here either, but, you know, I think this has been in the trailer. You know, the whole history of Stargazer, right? You know, the, you, do you understand? No, the, I don't know. The significance, I don't know the significance of Stargazer. I did not, as I was watching that, I did not know All the right, significance. For those of, of you who show. haven't seen it yet, but, you know, fast forward or whatever, but, but Stargazer was Jean Luc Picard's first command. And it was his, his, his first real test of command was, on the stargazer. So the fact that he's on the stargazer now, and that's what you saw at the end with the thing that happened that I won't spoil, um, makes such an important, so everything's coming full the, circle. Everything's coming full circle. The NSQ says in the trailer, which we're not spoiling anything. Cause this is in the trailer. The trial never ended. The, and I so, know. And, you know, and bringing in Guinan into this is, uh, you know, uh, anyway, I know, but I, here's I, the enough thing enough about it's, it, but, but it's 30, it's, yeah, the, the halfway through the episode, I knew I knew exactly what was coming. You have no idea. You have you have zero idea of what's coming. I knew I, you I, maybe going forward, but I knew how that episode was going to end. I knew uh, the of course it's the Borg. You knew that right away. And then you knew right. about the ending. I already knew it was coming. Pam and I were talking about it. I'm like, here it goes. Is and then then we saw it and like there it is. Come on. Well of course you knew that was coming from the trailer. You knew that Q was coming I back. Didn't see you knew the that- trailer. All right. Well, uh, you know, let me. Just, I know you things. stick with it on Pi Day. With it. I know. I know on Pi episode, I know things. I know things. <laughs> uh, it's like it's the Game of Thrones. It's a Tyrion Lannister. I drink wine and I know things. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, uh, I, I anyway. apologize to anybody who was going to watch. Yeah, it, we we just maybe. I mean, hopefully people were skipping through that. But you, that if but they, you if yeah, they but didn't. you loved it, and I'm gonna of course oh, watch episode two, absolutely and I'm going it. to upgrade and spend. I'm watching episode two tonight. I mean, oh, it's it's dropped. Right. I'm gonna it's, it's I'm gonna upgrade to and spend three more dollars a month so that I can watch it painlessly. You should totally oh, do my that. Goodness. I have a comment on our first story. Anyways, let's get to our first story, and then I want to. Absolutely, talk about yeah. This. So we have a great, yeah, we have a great show here planned. Um, we are going to actually continue our conversation around this. A nice segue, actually, about advertising and streaming services, because uh, we'll talk about some of the plans that Disney Plus has to think about advertising and what we think about that. Um, we'll also talk about NFTs and how they're now being used as collateral for loans, um, which is a fascinating trend as we might, uh, as we might expect. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about Netflix and how they're getting into the gaming sector. Uh, and we'll talk about a little, well, let's call it a yarn, if you will, a gripping yarn, if you will, of how knitting.com has a bit of a drama on its hands with the ire of its community. And then I'm going to rave a little bit uh, about how Disney is using data 
Uh, and uh, well, and Joe, well, you have a very interesting uh, commentary that I can't, actually can't wait for uh, that talks a little bit about platforming and Substack and a whole ma- number of things around. I'm going to guess it's around email. I'm going to guess your commentary is around the value of email, but that's just a guess because I don't, don't know. know. Is that you uh, don't know? You, unlike, I don't know. You're unlike how I knew tuned. Picard was going to end, you don't know <laughs> how this commentary is going to go. It always, for you, it always comes back to email. Like it always goes back to the Borg and Q. For you, it always goes back to email, which is not un Borg like if you really think about it. Um, what? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, let's get to our, <laughs> okay, let's get whatever. to our first story. Right, first story. Yeah, it comes courtesy uh, of uh, Axios. And yeah, Disney Plus uh, has announced, uh, much to the, I guess, chagrin of the, uh, of the world, uh, they're going to launch an ad-supported tier in the United States. The article opens up by saying Disney on Friday said it would debut an ad-supported tier for Disney Plus by the end of the year, and it plans to reveal the price of the new plan later this year. Why it matters, says Axios, is because the ad-supported tier, which will presumably cost much less than Disney Plus's current $8 a month subscription in North America, will help the company accrue more customers who may be looking to save money as the subscription streaming landscape becomes more crowded. Disney currently has nearly 200 million subscribers globally. 200 million subscribers on Disney Plus? Is that right? That can't yeah, be that's right. that's right. Is yeah, that right. A paid tier could help it reach its long-term subscriber goal of 230 to 260 million. No, it can't. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, get me get me on a rant here. Um, by 2024. Uh, so uh, the, the the article goes on to basically talk about you know the ad inventory that uh, some of the other parts of Disney has uh, and how this might help. Uh, how this basically creates an ad tier across multiple properties. Uh, And then it also actually includes a little bit of an analysis on the ones that have ads and the ones that don't, the other competitors, including Hulu and Showtime and Paramount Plus and Netflix and and all of that. Uh, What do you think? I mean, mean, you're obviously annoyed enough with Paramount Plus that you're going to upgrade. Is this a, a good sort of I guess Trojan horse, uh, you know, strategy for Disney Plus to to actually get people like you to, who are you know trying a free trial and having it and getting annoyed enough with ads to pay for subscription. No, I think this is a horrible okay. move. Agreed. This yep. this was totally. This was not a move where the Disney Plus team came together and said, "How can we create a better experience for our customers?" Exactly. This was. The accounting and financial folks or the long-term planners or the strategic plan holders or whatever you want to call them. And they looked and said, how are we going to get to this number? And we've got all this ad inventory. Are they all from Texas suddenly? Uh, I don't know why that came out. (laughs) I have no idea. That's how they talk in Orlando. All right. I got you. (laughs) Yeah. That was so strange that that just popped out of my mouth. Um, Yeah, yeah, exactly. This, This is... There's o- the only purpose of this is to try to for Disney to squeak out or squeeze out any amount of revenue ads and create a substandard experience as we just talked about with Paramount Plus. It's only eight dollars a month right now to get to get the great experience that Disney Plus had. I mean, when you and I first talked about this years ago, we were like, I hope they do it right, and they did. I think for the most part. Disney Plus has created a pretty good experience. Do you know what would Netflix would never do? I think they would never ever add a uh, a ad supported experience like this because they know what do they do? They just raise prices continually. Netflix right now are, they're raising their price another dollar a month or whatever they're doing. So if they were looking to get the numbers that they want to get or whatever, it would be better off if they said, "Look, let's just change our eight dollar a month subscription to nine twenty five." That's reasonable. People will pay it for the experience that we're giving, and let's just keep ads off this platform. The other thing they could consider is yeah. what Prime does. Prime has little ads all over the place that you never really notice. They play before a lot of the movies that they play. They don't charge anything different for Prime membership, whether it's an ad or not ad-supported environment. They just do it. I'd rather them just do it and create little ads somewhere here and there that are integrated, that make sense, that 10 second ad before they play, you know, the next version of Obi-Wan Kenobi would be better off yep. with me than interrupting my experience throughout like it like it was with Picard. That's right. 
It's a little bit like the ads that you see before a, a movie when you go to the movie. Yeah, theater, and I'm right? okay with that. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Like, I, and I don't know if you've seen on Prime. Prime will do, they'll do like a 15 second preview of something. Usually, it's an Amazon ad, but they'll yeah. preview something, yeah. and they got all kinds of Amazon products. It's like fine, 10 seconds. I can deal with that. Um, yeah. Well, I think you said it well when it. I mean, because both Netflix and Prime have raised their subscription price. Yeah. In the last few months, right? And Prime most. Notably, I mean, Prime went up a lot, um, and people pay it, right? I mean, people, you know, now it comes with a lot more than just streaming-based entertainment. Prime comes with, you know, shipping and all sorts of Amazon features, which is the way to think about subscription these days. You know, you're subscribing to Amazon; you're not subscribing to, which is exactly what you should be thinking about with, with Disney. Disney. We've talked, I mean, you get talked to that about this my, a couple months yeah, ago, I'll, where and I'll talk about it. Yeah, that. I'll talk about it again. Yeah, exactly. It's like a subscription to Disney should be increased that also includes – because I think, just like you, this is an awful, stupid move because I think it, it'll have the exact opposite intended reaction, which is it provides people with an exit door, right? You know, In other words, you, when you sign them up for a subscription, you're basically sealing everybody in and saying, now you're in the family. You're kind of in. This is basically going to say, oh, you mean I can cancel my subscription and still get Disney Plus and all I got to do is watch ads? Well, the only thing I use it for is basically sitting the kids in front of it so I can go off and do my thing and put kids in front of Disney Plus so that they've got access to it. I don't care if they have to watch Could ads. I, you know, it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. And so that's the – that's the, you know, you're, you're providing an exit ramp for, for subscribers instead of saying we're making it more valuable – and charging you a little more as a reason for that, we are saying, hey, we're actually going to degrade the service and make it cheaper. It's just, it's not something Disney usually does, right? I mean, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't change the ticket price to Disney, Disney World or Disneyland and say, oh, by the way, we're going to give you a discounted ticket price if you see more you know, ads. That's such that's a great just, point. It's like, it's kind of like Apple is a premium brand. Right. right. Disney is a premium brand. There was just this just came out this week. There was a whole story and I can't think maybe it was in the New Yorker or something like that. It talked about how so many families and so many people are up in arms because nobody can afford Disney World anymore. It is incredibly right. expensive to take a family to Disney World than do anything like this. But yet they're nickel and diming the Disney Plus experience. It makes no sense. That's right. That's right. They're 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 holding maybe. fast with the theme parks. And but not but not with this, and so it's so very un Disney of them to do this. It's like it's just absolutely it, I, I, it's baffling to me why they would do this. I mean, look, Disney has not been you know their their latest you know their, their latest forays into public relations over the last couple of weeks have not been terribly uh, you know adroit. So, you know, it would be awesome it, if they the, came out with and said, Look. We need to make more money on Disney Plus. We're investing a ton in new content. You can see what we're doing with the Star Wars and the Marvel and everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to for we're going to grandfather everyone in for this not whatever eight dollar rate for the next year, and then we're upping it to twelve bucks. Yeah, and people or, would say or, okay or, or fine. Yeah, exactly. Or, or raise it to nine twenty five, and you get one free premium movie every. Oh, there month, you go. Right? That's we're, perfect. You, you know I would I mean? love that. Yeah, because then I can watch Mulan again, which was, by the exactly. way, wonderful. All the things that, you know, I mean, it's always the thing that you do. You know, the, the basic 101 of subscription management is to continually increase the subscription for things that not everybody uses, right? Be because what you're doing is basically giving, you know, you're managing your costs in a way that adding to the value is perceived, but doesn't actually directly you know, affect your cost. So you add it, you know, so if your software is a service, you add a feature that not everybody's going to use extra storage. We're going to raise the subscription price for everybody, but you get two terabytes of more storage. Right. And so you're like, Oh, I don't need two terabytes of storage, but isn't that nice. Right. And so that's, that's the way you do this. And I, moving to an ad supported business is just a mistake. Just I totally mistake. agree. The, the last thing on Netflix actually, my wife was so upset. She 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 gets upset at Netflix every time they do an increase, and whatever it's at fifteen bucks a month or whatever now. But I just went to a movie with my oldest. We went to see the new Batman movie, and I paid thirteen dollars and fifty cents per person, so twenty six bucks yeah. to go see that movie. And 
so there's that. And by the way, Batman did tremendous over the weekend. $128 million. Fantastic. Crushed it. Uh, yep. it the movie's in- interesting. It's a good map, Batman. I would, I would recommend it if you like DC movies. But here we are, Nickel and Diamond on Disney Plus for this ad-supported stuff. I... I don't. I literally don't get. It. I think Netflix is smart. They could probably go all the way up to twenty twenty five bucks, and they're not going to lose a lot. I really don't. Yeah. I really don't I think, think that's so. True. Because if we look at it comparative to the other content experiences that are out there, it's not that much money. So, yeah, yeah, whatevs. All right, moving on. Enough about the advertising supported model. Let's look at. NFTs, because it's been about 10 seconds since we've talked about NFTs. Um, here's something interesting. This is this fascinated me, this whole story here. Uh, the story itself comes from a, a site called blockworks.co, By the way, which I had not heard great, of. Great uh, educational site for crypto. Is it? All yeah, right. They, really, go. they've yeah. got newsletter, podcasts. They've really done. I mean, they are a media company. It, it's really amazing great. what they've done. Which, by the way you know, is one of the reasons that my little thing has been delayed because, you know, just, you know, n- no spoiler alerts here, but my little thing that I was going to be announcing was going to be a media site around Web 3.0. And the world does not need another media site around Web 3.0 right now. There is plenty of people covering the news uh, around what's going on in, in Web 3. Um, so you didn't need a chucklehead like me to tell you about that. And besides, you've got this podcast. Anyway, Anyway, uh, let's talk about this because this is a fascinating story. In the largest ever NFT-backed loan, 101 CryptoPunks have been put up as collateral uh, for a $8 million loan. The story opens up by saying, has, is what in, in what has been billed as the largest ever NFT-backed loan, an anonymous borrow borrower, excuse me, just took out an $8 million loan collateralized by their collection of 101 CryptoPunks. The loan has an APR of 10% and a 30-day duration, meaning, wow, then what's that guy need to buy? Yeah, I know. Like, uh, no. What, what are like, we doing what, there? What do you need? <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's like uh, does it come in a baggie and do you smoke it? But anyway, uh, it was facilitated by liquidity scaling solution Metastreet on peer-to-peer lending platform NFT Phi. Uh, The finance is seen by industry participants as a bellwether of future lending secured by digital collectibles, a market expected to grow as institutional interest in the sector continues to build. And the article goes on to talk about the loan uh, for another 300 words or so just to make sure that they can get SEO uh, stuff. But other than that, yeah, it, that, that's basically the story. What do you, what, what say you about this? I have, I definitely have a, 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 uh, it was surprising to me. One part of this was really surprising to me, but I wanted to get your take Well, I was on trying this. to figure out why a, a whale who's taking out this loan, who has seemingly hundreds of millions of dollars worth of cryptocurrency in many different forms, needs a 30-day loan, $8 million loan, unless just to do it. Right, unless it's just like, why not? I just want to see, yeah. Because let's I wanted see, to see, see if, we see if I could get it and whatever. What this tells me, it, first of all, I mean, this is multi-millions of dollars worth of crypto punks so that it's not much it's not a risky loan for to make at all it's probably less risky than buying certain plots of land in the united states if you will so i i think that no problem there i think what you're seeing is the legitimization of cryptocurrency in all its forms nft social tokens uh, you just saw the Biden administration, even though it didn't say much, it came out with an executive order that said we are, yes, for regulation of the cryptocurrency industry, but we want the United yeah. States to be one of the technological leaders behind this. And so everybody's like, this is great. Of course, the industry wants to be regulated and they also want the support of the United States and other countries. And I think you're seeing this. Every major bank in the world now has some kind of take or influence in the market uh, right now. So it is just another asset class, I think. Yeah. So if, if I've learned anything over, because 2020, we were really talking about NFTs is new and 2021, okay, we had some, you know, huge bubble and now we're sort of normalizing things. And I think, you know, t- 23, 24, 25, we're seeing another type of asset class that is like anything else that we would see out there. 
And whether we call them NFTs or social tokens or even crypto, it all doesn't matter. They're definitely valuable. And how do we know it's valuable? How do we know it's going to stay? Because it's completely intertwined with our current financial system today. That's right. Uh, well, you know, and so here's what I have a question for you. It, first of all, who knew that? Did you know that there was one person who owned 1% of all crypto yes. punks? Yeah, oh, yeah you because did. when okay. you go to. So, Lar. Lar, I know more about CryptoPunks than most of the other NFT projects. And if you go to Larva Labs, who's the creator of CryptoPunks and also MeBit, MeBits and a number of other really good projects, you can click uh, and see how many, like who are the big whales that own. Like, for example, Gary Vaynerchuk owns, I think he owns more than 100 himself. He owns a ton with okay. purple caps. For whatever reason, he loves purple caps and he owns like half of the purple caps. So, yeah. I, I I did know. There's quite a few whales out there. Now there's some uh, by the I way I did not know. There's that. some yeah. that you look at that haven't been touched in a while. Some people think those are dead. Because if you go back to the history of how CryptoPunks got started and Larva Labs are just two people and they sent these out for free to a bunch of people. And this was back before you had systems that could really figure out oh, my digital wallet, whatever, how do I find these things? And sure. some people were sent a lot of really valuable crypto punks now, and at the time didn't think anything of it, lost their wallets. And so nobody knows how many crypto punks actually are defunct. So there's a lot less than 10,000 of them, if you will. So there you go. Well, there you yeah. go. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So basically, the anonymous person here could be Gary V. Uh, you, you know, that's, that's not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, by the way, just a little Gary V. He's doing a whole version two of V Friends, which is fascinating. Yeah, they're like being yeah. upgraded. Like if you bought one of the version ones and you get the ver the version twos, it morphs into something else with other benefits. And I know a lot of people don't like Gary Vaynerchuk, but it's really fascinating to see that he is totally all in on this NFT I, thing. So love him or hate him, he's. He's working the system. I mean, there's, you know, there's, you know, that's, there's no He's doubt about that. He's made millions and millions of yeah. dollars off of this. Yeah. And it just prints yeah. money because every day, I think he gets 5% well, we'll of everything see. traded. I, mean, I wonder if it's he's made millions of dollars or he has theoretical paper value of millions of dollars because it seems like he's invested in this that hasn't, in a way that hasn't really converted to, I mean, some of it, I'm sure, is converted into real dollars, but it, it, it feels like, I, I don't have any intimate knowledge of this, but it feels like he's building this and reinvesting into it in a way that holding it is what sets the value rather than sort of bridging it out to actual dollars. Well, I was only doing the royalty value. So I believe the royalty value that Gary gets on every one of these is either 5% ah, okay. or 2.5%. Right. So I'm just I'm on the site right now on OpenSea. Forty four point K, forty four thousand ETH have traded hands. Do so do that times ETH and ETH right now is like worth twenty six hundred dollars per. Yeah. Do the percentage. So that's he's made multiple yeah. billions of dollars just off of the royalty. Just alone. on the sales. Yeah. Just on the and resale. That's real money. Basically the resale. Yeah. And then plus that, that is the floor money. price is fifteen ETH. So what's that? Three thousand forty Forty thousand dollars per NFT that he right. has of the ten thousand, and if so, right. I don't want to you know, bore people with math. But he has a ton of those himself that he either he's just holding on to. I'm sure, I'm sure. So they're they're going up, but <laughs> but his I, I, pump and dump I think is the technical well, term. For he that. was yeah, I listened but. to him on a podcast a couple months ago, and he said that his goal was to have the highest floor price of any. Uh, crypto project and he's in the top 10 for sure you know, yeah you got board apes and you got crypto punks and you got some other ones and you got gary v yeah so good for yeah. him i listened to a podcast not too long ago with beeple um who i was very surprised at hearing him talk um and his level of sort of you know the 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 level of aw shucks i never figured it was going to do this was high um, and I believe, yeah. I believe his sort of, you know, his, his sort of, you know, he was just some goofy artist, you know, a computer scientist really, right. You know, with no real art knowledge, just making funny stuff that he thought was funny and turned into a thing. And it's, it's just, you know, you talk about catching lightning in a bottle. I mean, that's just, it's just crazy. There's a lot of, uh, 
crypto billionaires that happened in between 2019 and 2021. So yeah. a lot of craziness. But yeah, anyways, yeah, you're, you're back to the article. I, I I would expect to see these things more and more, and uh, it's just it's just going to be another thing. Like I talked to yeah. a financial guy what, a couple months ago. We might have talked about it. And he, he was talking about cryptocurrency like it's such an odd thing. And I said, it was an odd thing in 17 when we saw that bubble. But it's not an odd thing anymore. Most people know about it. You've got a good percent. You've got 10 to 20% of, of people in the United States that own some kind of cryptocurrency right now. Uh, that's growing at a phenomenal rate. And it's growing as fast as mobile phones grew in, um, in, the, in the 2000s. So... There's no reason that this is going to stop. Well, the reason that fascinates me so much is because, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is that, you know, creating a content strategy over the top of your NFTs, whether you're a brand or whether you're a content creator or, you know, or somewhere in between. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this a few shows ago when we talked about crypto dads. And we said, you know, one of the things that was being considered here that would raise the value of the NFTs, which were issued first, would be making a television show or creating some sort of intellectual property around creativity where you, you know, ostensibly own a character of a television show. And so when you start to see finance start to happen, that starts to put into reality, you know, practical reality, the idea of saying, huh, I can issue, if I'm a brand... I can come up with a series of NFTs around a project and I can creatively put this together in a way that delivers some value, issue the project out for little, very little cost, get people to ostensibly crowdfund or fractionalized ownership of all of that, you know, of of here's, you know, you have, you know, and basically fund the creation of the product which might be the television show or a movie or an ebook or whatever it may be so that you're financing using you see basically using marketing content to finance the creation of more marketing content which can then be used as collateralized assets to take out a loan to fund more content <laughs> you know what i mean so in killing marketing we talked about we talked about the idea of turning marketing into a profit center well this this is the way to turn your marketing content into collateralized assets That's right. Yep. At, at, and uh, I mean, that's just crazy to me right now. But but it, here it is happening, and so it, it it'll be really interesting. Yeah, to and watch you this. see the you see those uh, individuals that have built communities that get people really excited about this, and, and they they create an NFT project that's very successful right from the start because they built this community and this excitement. Everyone feels a little bit of ownership. But and, and again, there's two things that's going in the favor of these types of projects. First of all, you mentioned money. There's a ton of money, maybe more money from the VC community going into crypto projects than anything else. And the second thing is talent. If people are leaving Google and Amazon and Microsoft, where are they going? They're going to crypto projects. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk to anybody in crypto land and, and you just see this flood of Silicon Valley, really smart folks going to these crypto projects. So that and that's a really good side for the industry if you see smart people headed yeah. that direction. So we'll see. Well, and, and the overall, and this will be a nice segue into our next uh, story here, which is you know the overall direction, of course, is into content and content creation, right? I mean, because that's at the end of the day what we're really talking about here. Um, our next story comes to us courtesy of nexttv.com, uh, which talks about all things television. And the story here, and uh, big thanks to Stephen Davis, uh, f- friend and family of the show here, is for sending this story over. Uh, Netflix pays $72 million to acquire Finland's Next Games. Uh, the maker of mobile games, including Stranger Things Puzzle Tales, generated nearly $31 million of business in 2020, mainly off in-game purchases. Netflix has said it had agreed to pay about $72 million to acquire Finnish mobile games Next Games uh, in their transaction. Helsinki-based Next Games has around 120 employees, has already made a game tied to popular Netflix series Stranger Things Puzzle Tales. Uh, they've also published two titles based on AMC's long-running The Walking Dead franchise. 
that for Netflix, it's the latest move um, moving from their uh, former EA executive hired by the streaming company last July to build a games division. And so here we go. Netflix doing what we just talked about with Disney sort of as a theme here, which is instead of moving to advertising, said, hey, let's start expanding vertically. Let's start going into games and start you know streaming out games as well as as movies and television shows and the original productions that all of that uh, that all of that creates what what do you think I mean this is this seems like a logical move for you, them you remember when Queen's Gambit came out and was such a hit and the chessboard yeah. started to fly off that you couldn't find a chessboard anywhere and we talked about yep. it on the show it's too bad that Netflix didn't anticipate something like this and they could have had a line of video games uh, products that you buy off the shelf, branded Queen's Gambit stuff, and they did. They got late to the party and never took advantage of that. It was the most popular show for months in the world. Well, this yeah. is Netflix taking care of that because it's not. They know that they're building these brands right now, and just one revenue stream from their content is their subscription. They have all sorts yes. of additional like this. I mean. Obviously, perfect that they got a new Stranger Things coming out soon. You could have a new game for that. They've got all, I mean, how many new shows are they, 20 or something a month that they launch? They can pick and say, this one needs a video game. This one needs that for brand extensions. It's it's brilliant. And, and you talk about Aqua hires all the time. They're hiring this talent in-house. So they have these things that they can launch on an ongoing basis. Well, and the other thing is that they now very much in the same way that they've become a development shop for uh, for television shows. I mean, you know, basically streamed entertainment, to, to, for yeah. lack of a better word. They can become the same kind of developer for streaming games. In other words, they, they don't. it doesn't have to just be their intellectual property. They could continue making games for people like AMC or, you know, HBO or others that don't have games and become a distribution partner as well as a development partner for those kinds of, uh, you know, those, those as well. Right. So if they want to release a, a, a new Xbox game or they want to release a new, uh, a, a, you know, game for Sony PlayStation, they could, they could develop that too. I mean, they probably won't, there's no reason to, because they can simply make a great living off of not, you know, not being on anybody else's platform, but rather just building for their own. So it, it, God, it just makes all the sense in the world to me that they're that they're expanding into this no, area. It's, it's very smart, and as we talked about a few weeks ago, they've just started to get going in this. They are they have a lot of cash. They're going to start buying a lot more pieces to the pie so that they can create multiple content experiences outside of the Netflix platform. So this, when I saw this and you you send it over, I'm like, oh my god, that makes perfect sense. Of course, yeah. Yeah. And you're going to see this happen, by the way, prediction time. You know, uh, I would predict probably in the not too diff distant future. And I think, oh, was this one of our predictions on our prediction show that we said that Facebook would buy Epic? I don't remember. I, I, I usually, Facebook's going to buy I usually somebody. block out Facebook, all previous yeah. episodes <laughs> just to make it through. That's probably a just wise to make it thing. through the day. That's probably a wise choice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's probably yeah. a good good idea. Exactly. Yeah, to to slowly block that out. But yeah, look for, look for Facebook to buy somebody. You know, probably after the first reports that you know the uh, the development of the metaverse isn't going as well as they thought it might. Um, then actually look for. You know, yeah, for I mean, I I actually thought. Happen. I mean, it's going to have to. The stock price is going to have to come up a little bit before I they think, actually go do something. I think like that, that what but, I was thinking is that Facebook would buy current. Uh, metaverse companies like Sandbox or Decentraland. That's what I thought. But I think that was my oh, well. prediction. Oh, that yeah, that's happen. oh, that's interesting. Um, that's that's although that's more niche, right? I mean, that's so niche right now. The Decentraland and those kinds of things. Buying Epic would give them an immediate well, didn't somebody creative just buy, somebody revenue just stream as well as yeah? Did they? No, Epic Bames just made some. Uh, uh, acquisitions. Um, Epic just acquired Band. Oh, that's right. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. Epic got was it, not got acquired. It, got it. Sony. I, is this still, is a, and then yeah. then Sony invested two hundred fifty million dollars into Epic Games. 
Yeah, that doesn't surprise me either because they've they've been doing that. You know, both Microsoft and Sony have been making those strategic investments in game developers for some time to develop big box titles. Right. Sony buys one point four percent, two hundred and fifty million dollars stake in Fortnite's Epic Games. Wow, yeah. Epic Games is yeah. really valued at a lot of <laughs> a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, Epic is uh, Epic Holy is due. Yeah. They're a fascinating little company. Not a little company. Right. They're a fascinating company. Well, yeah, you stuff. talked about Fortnite last time. I'm just like, yeah, you're right. They're oh doing my gosh. some amazing They're just, things. So. Yeah. Well, by the way, I've it's, since then I have been diving deep down the rabbit hole of Bandcamp and just finding all sorts of really interesting musical artists. I I, I did not I I did not anticipate going down that far. But I, I really are you going to put your music on Bandcamp? It. No, I am not going to put any music on Bandcamp. Nobody needs to hear my I nonsense. Like your, I mean, yeah. this is our theme music. Is your music? I yeah, but you know that's you know, that's all. <laughs> that's, yeah, if we, I can I can voice that on the audience because no, you know, what, it's, what, it's our no, show. No, what but, was the what's the song that you still get checks for? I get so <laughs> I did a rap song, and, and no, you will not hear it here. Um, that actually, I used to do soundtrack work. Um, and I still get royalties from this little rap song that I did. I did not rap on it. It's just a, a, a you know a, a a clip that I've basically used as a loop. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it gets played a lot on Jersey Shore. Uh, and I didn't even know this was a real thing, but there is apparently a show called The Basketball Wives. Um, I didn't know this, but there's apparently a show called The Basketball Wives where the show was also used. And I get you know I get these checks from like you know. Poland, right? You know where where Jersey Shore played, you know, in Czechoslovakia or something, and and I get a, you know, I get a I get a royalty check for like four dollars or something. So yeah, about about every every six months I get a check for like you know I don't know twenty two dollars or something. Okay, you can buy yourself for, for, for that. a Starbucks and a and a muffin. I I, I got my first royalty check from Audible uh, in a long time for uh, for experiences, uh, and it was eighteen cents. Oh. Yeah. I, 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 just fant- fantastic How does royalty that even check. happen? 18 cents. How does that even... Yeah. Did one person know. listen to... Like, what? 18 cents? I don't know. What kind of deal is yeah, that? Yeah, Audible. Yeah. yeah. That's how cents. Amazon gets you. Yeah. They, they actually spent more money mailing it to me than the check oh, is worth. don't get me started is, on that. We got we got yeah, one from yeah. the gas company for 83 cents. I'm like, what? Like, just don't even send it. You spent more. Right. I'm putting the whole thing together. You spent more trying to collect it than, what, yeah. What the heck? Well, whatever. What all right. The, what the what? The what? what? All right. What the what? Uh, all right. Our last story that we're going to cover before we get to Rants and Rays is, of course, uh, a very interesting one. And, and first and foremost, huge hat tip to Bethany Johnson, uh, friend, family, contributor to this show so often in the past. Um, thank you, Bethany, for this story uh, that you tweeted at us and said, I assume you guys are all over this, but yeah, and, and we, we were, were not we were all as soon over this. As she sent us the tweet. Yeah, we were as soon as you <laughs> said. Yeah. So the headline here from InputMag.com, and Bethany's one of those people, by the way, that finds the most obscure publications on the planet, uh, and and sends this. I had never heard of this magazine before, but InputMag.com has a uh, has a uh, uh, I guess it's a whole topic that controversy um, is the topic area and the headline is a gripping yarn inside the knitting.com drama I did not know that there was a drama at knitting.com but there is the head uh, the opening of the article says Michael Jackness which is I, just I, I read Michael Jackson for three villain. times before I saw Jack yeah Michael Jackness um, which is the perfect name for a villain um, and as he turns out to be kind Jack of the Ness, villain isn't of the that story. like Guinness that tastes like Jack Daniels or something. It's, it's, it's sort of like you're jacked up, right? You know, you get, you know, what is your jackness score, right? You get, you get your jackness or, score. Or jackness sits yeah. right next to G Fuel in the grocery that's store. Right. It's like you yeah, can have oh, G Fuel it. or that's you right. can have jackness. Exactly. You have jackness. <laughs> jack, jack, jackness. <laughs> Text me at 1 800 Beachbody for jackness. <laughs> okay. We are, we, we, Michael we Jackness is real jobs. Yes. Something uh, has been in the world of e-commerce uh, for nearly six years. In that time, he's recorded more than 400 podcast episodes and written a slew of blog posts documenting the journey he and his e-com crew business partner, Dave Bryant, have been on. 
The things that we've done uniquely have been sharing everything that we do, all of our brands, all of our products, all of our successes, and all of our failures, says Jackness, who is 45 years old. The transparency has helped the two, uh, based in San Fran- uh, uh, Jackness is based in San Diego, and Bryant from Vancouver built up a big audience for their exploits in the e-commerce industry. But over the last few weeks, their openness appears to have backfired. They're now under attack from the online knitting community for their plans for the site knitting.com, and the controversy threatens to derail their new venture. Uh, Why is this relevant to our audience, say you? Well, here's what happened. Apparently, on February 16th, the crew, the e-com crew, these two guys, published a blog post and a podcast episode outlining their latest attempt to launch an e-commerce business uh, around knitting.com. They'd spent uh, uh, $80,000 of a planned budget between $250,000 and $500,000 to buy the dormant domain knitting.com. The plan was to launch an Amazon-based direct-to-consumer retail brand, uh, basically as they they said it. They wanted to launch this new thing and wanted to launch this new e-commerce. Uh, and basically, the knitting community, after hearing about this, their plans for what they wanted to do, kind of went batshit crazy and said, uh, well, the quote was, to give you an analogy, it was like two guys with an air fryer under their arm walking into the oldest restaurant in the country and proudly explaining how they were going to make a million dollars a year selling air fried frozen chicken nuggets from Costco. Uh, says Amy Nowakowski, a New York-based marketing strategist and knitter, who is one of those to highlight the issues with the knitting.com plan. Basically, those in the knitting world uh, did not like this plan at all and let them hear about it in the worst way possible. Um, they have now, I think, canceled those plans to launch something. And the article goes on in some detail to sort of basically tell both sides of the story. Uh, what, what, I mean, there's so many lessons oh, geez, here, yes. but, 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 you know, what is your main takeaway from this? And, and, and then, you know, and well, your take well, first thing it. is I have no problem with, brands and individuals sharing everything on their journey. And you know that a lot of people do that and they built up a great success. But I do think there's a limit. If you're going to launch a product, I would rather them just launch the product and go forward and not have to talk about what they're going to do with it. Just do it. They bought knitting. They don't have to tell anybody. Buy knitting.com. $80,000 is an amazing deal for knitting.com. If they got it for that price, I don't know how they did it. They got that. They're going to fix it up. They're going to launch. And then you come out with knitting.com and you wouldn't get this backlash. It's because it's because they were so open about it. The second thing I would say is a lot of these people just have bad feelings because they didn't get the idea. There should have been 20 people in the knitting community that should have bought knitting.com. They didn't do it. If it was dormant for a long time and none of these people who are complaining in this article look to buy it, well, shame on them. Because they should have. So somebody else smart in e-commerce knows that they can take knitting.com, they could fix it up a little bit, and even just put some new content and some Google ads on there and probably make a million dollars a year. It's it's done. There's a whole industry around it. So I, I guess I'm just like, uh, okay, whatever. I think that there's... <sighs> go, go for it. I think these two guys should absolutely go for it. They're not doing anything wrong. And yes... And if you read this article, they sort of describe the knitting community as they don't know it. And obviously they don't. Sometimes you should well, just keep your mouth shut. Not, if right. they would have not done That's it, right. they, if they just went on with the process and they bought knitting.com and they got the content people involved and they figured out their production process and editorial plan and whatever, and they came out in June 1st and they launched the thing, they would have never saw any of this. Yep. So whatever. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. My take on this is that they, you know, this is the, and I watch this happen in, uh, in businesses all the time. You get so far out over your skis about wanting to promote something that you forget that you need to build the thing before you promote it. And, and so, you know, I've watched this happen uh, when there's been acquisitions. You know, we talked on this show years ago about the beer company that bought the brew. There's some microbrewing community, and 
uh, I think it was actually AB, in fact. I think it, so. It was one of yeah. the bigger it, bigger uh, brewing companies that bought this microbrewery community. And instead of just buying it and you know sort of infusing it with great content and budget and talent to be able to foster that community and live on it, they decided to release a press release that talked about how, you know, how awesome it was for a huge company like this to come in and be able to save a brewing, you know, community and blah, 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 and basically mis, mis, mispronounced everything, right? You know, and, and, and really pissed off the entire community to the point where they left. They just said, we don't need yeah. this. We don't, we don't need the man coming in and telling us what, how to do microbrewery. And so same thing here. They just got way out ahead of their skis here. You know, yes, it's nice that you're being transparent about your process and everything you're doing, but telling your story before you're ready to tell it is just a recipe for disaster. That's a great point. Telling and, your story before you're ready to tell it. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. You know, and, and, and to your point about the, the, the community getting so angry, I, I also agree, which is, you know, this is a little bit like, you know, you know, you see that, that art, right. That, you know, it's literally a white canvas with a red stripe on it. And, and you walk into the modern art museum and you see that giant white canvas with a red stripe on it that's sold for $50 million. And you go, well, I could have done that. And you go, but you didn't, that's the point. You, you didn't do it. And so for them to be so angry is, is a little bit confusing to me because, you know, they didn't do it either, right? They didn't build a community around this. And so, it, all of you know, all of this basically speaks to the point of we're we're in we're in a place right now where, you know, if you're going to try and build a community, uh, the, you need to do so carefully, and you want to do so with trust. And if you're the creator of the community, don't get ahead of your skis here because you feel like you have to move fast because that's the quickest way to kill something. And if you're on the other side of that community. It, it's, you know, give it a chance, give it a shot, you know, before you sort of dismiss it just because you didn't do it doesn't mean it's not yeah. good. Um, and, and that's, the, so that's the lesson here. And it goes back to the thing, you know, all the way to the beginning of the show when I said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to wait a little bit before I announce my little thing. That's exactly yeah, why exactly. <laughs> I, I see stories like this and I go, yeah, I'm going to make sure it's cool. And I'm going to, do some things first before I get too far out ahead of my skis here. So, uh, you know, there's, yeah. there's so many Good content stuff. creators out there that are like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And they, they t- talk about yeah, it everywhere. I'm like, oh, that's fine. But why, why are you yeah. doing that and setting yourself up for failure? Launch it when it's right. ready. And then when it's, when people actually can engage in it, great, you've got something and you can market it then. So that's right. That's right. And if you're looking for accountability, like you're using your community, you know, or a community for, you know, as an accountability coach. I love that too, but it's within the community, a smaller portion within, within your community. So if these guys had, if these guys had sort of gone into the knitting dot, you know, not knitting.com because that didn't exist, but you know, the, and there are plenty of knitting communities, by the way, that I know. And if they'd gone into those communities and said, Hey, what do you guys think about this? And what do you guys think about that? And, you know, we're just trying to learn and we're just trying to understand and be open about that part of their process they would have been much, much better off than, you know, they may still have gotten a a blowback from it, but they would have been much better off than simply announcing on their own podcast to their own audience. Hey guys, you know, we're, here's what we're going to do. It's like their audience doesn't care, right? Their audience only is, is their audience is the inside baseball people. It's like, yeah, go do that. I don't give a shit. Right. You know, so, you know, whatever. Exactly. Just a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hurt feelings that some people didn't have an idea about this and they're like, that's right. That's Crying right. in their cheerio. All right. It is yeah. now it is now time for <laughs> PS, you posted on Facebook, by the way, a a whole thing about cereal yes. that just was which disturbs me with your comment last week around the whole McDonald's thing and about the fourteen Big Macs that you ate. Plus I'm concerned about your <laughs> nutritional health, my friend. I really Folks, am. I was at Sam's Club with my wife and they had Frosty's cereal. Frosty's the cereal. Frosty's and Wendy's. Wendy's, by the Wendy's. way. Wendy's, Frosty's yes. Frosty's cereal. I just thought it was glorious. I thought that it was amazing. I've never seen something like that. I did not buy that, but I have been told that it's really good with chocolate milk. So, whatever. Whatevs. There you go. Haters are going right. to hate. <laughs> 
haters are going to hate. And speaking of which, it is now quickly time for our rants and rave section when Joe and I go off on a little bit of a rant or a little bit of a rave over something that makes us uh, feel like Aaron Rodgers or feel like, uh, well, Carson Wentz, right? Carson Wentz just got traded to the commanders um, and he's got to be feeling kind of, you know, like, you know, not wanted <laughs> these days. Uh, what do you got going yeah, on? Let me but do. I go have, for, I've got or quick, I can go first. Yeah, if quick you want. commentary yeah. here. And yeah. this was sent to me by uh, Heath Dingwell, and Heath is a g- great member of our uh, Tilt Discord community, uh, sent this on. And I thought that this was so interesting. Um, it comes from, what is it? What is this? Mid the, the newsletter is called Midrange, and it's by Ernie Smith, and it's congratulations, you've been platformed. Which is basically, I would call it deep platform, but whatever, you, whatever you want to call it. But he talks about the fact that Substack's new app, no matter the justification, changes the rules around the pledge the company made to its customers, and puts up a fresh barricade to the openness of the open internet. Long story short, Substack created an app where people could decide that they wanted to use the app to engage in newsletters instead of getting an actual e-newsletter from the creators. So just think about that for a little bit. It means Substack has created yeah. sort of a competitive um, content experience against their creators. And they're trying to become the That's place. Right. I'll go to the Substack app to get all my information instead of the creator sending me an individual email using Substack. It's a very key difference. And it's something that you and I had talked about this. We, we had... I don't want to say misgivings about Substack, but I've always questions like, yes, it's it's not really like an external email provider because it is trying to become a platform and all kinds of people. It's kind of like what we just t- talked about with knitting.com really got upset at this launch from Substack because it looks like this platform, Substack app platform, is trying to come between the reader and the creator. And so I just wanted to put this out there because – we have to watch ourselves as creators. These things are happening over and over. Substack, of course, they want to become more powerful, make more money, do all the things that profitable companies want to do. And this was sort of in their uh, five-year plan, if you will. But at the same time, it really could hurt the creators and the email newsletter writers that are on their platform. And it's concerning. So the article, I, I would absolutely read it. It's really concerning as you see more and more of these things happen on other platforms and where they continually make changes and they continually decide not to show your content. And it will happen over and over and over again. And we, as content creators, have to find ways to create direct connections with our audience and you said at the beginning of this program email i've always been a big fan of email for that reason and even if you use an email platform you can move from one to another your email addresses are yours you have their opt-in permission to use those that's the value exchange fantastic Substack, uh, sort of in the middle and it's quite con- and yeah. this is quite concerning to me i don't know if you had a take but i was concerned uh, my only take is to agree with you a hundred percent and basically say if you're looking around the table and you can't figure out what the product is, it's you. And, you know, Substack is just proving that you are the product and they are going to sell you. So, um, you know, we'll see if they walk this back. We'll see if they implement features on this platform that make it, you know, not so competitive with email yeah. lists. But addressable audiences here is the value and your list, you know, you can either build, you can spend time building their platform or build your platform. And, you know, we, we've, <laughs> we've too long said the, the rented landline to, to, to under, you know, to, you all understand that at this point it is, you know, and everybody is beginning to understand this. And, and so you, you know, manage, manage your expectations accordingly and watch what they do, not what they there say. You go. Absolutely. Be careful. If you're on Substack, watch your back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, very quickly here. Uh, I wanted to just uh, ra- well, it's more commentary, I guess, than a rave, but it but it is actually just sort of pointing things out. This is an article that's in Digiday, great article, uh, and the headline is how Disney uh, is using its audience data and Hulu's ad tech to compete with Google and Meta and Amazon, and 
it's nothing surprising in here, right? The article basically covers off and says, you know, things like m- many media companies, it actually opens with that saying, have been talking about trying to compete with Google and Meta for the advertising dollars. And of course, they command, I think, together 85 or 90% of all digital advertising dollars. Um, Amazon certainly encroaching on that over the last six months or so as they become the sort of huge uh, elephant in the room when it comes to search ads and, and display ads. Um, they sit on so much data, said one agency executive, that when you break down their offering, they're speaking now about Disney, they have Hulu, the largest CTV app of ad-supported content, um, and and Hulu is a interesting uh, candidate here because apparently, according to this article, from a premium content perspective is the biggest in terms of ad supported and the number of users that are that are that are actually on that platform consuming content, but also consuming advertising. Um, in any event, Disney's now put that number on scale, 218 million monthly unique visitors in the U.S. to its media properties, 100 million household level IDs, 160 million connected TVs, 190 million device IDs. Uh, we just, we've just we just talked about this you know, 30 minutes ago when we covered this story. The amount of data that uh, direct addressable audience data that Disney has is absolutely staggering. And so what they're doing is they're doing everything like Meta is doing and what Google is doing from an advertising perspective, and they're creating an ecosystem. And creating that ecosystem includes extending Hulu's, uh, you know, the shoppable ad formats to other Disney properties. They're putting in uh, Hulu self-service ad buying tools. So now that you can start to buy self-service ads through Disney's uh, ecosystem and start buying ads on the Disney quote unquote network, you're opening up the attribution tool to start to see where all those leads are coming from and how those ads are performing. Um, And then they're opening up, you know, a data, what they're calling a data clean room program to match their customer data with Disney's audience data and be able to see some, get some insights from all of that. All of that is to say all those things that Google is so powerful at being able to do retargeting through first party data, being able to track your ad across YouTube, across Google mail, across all the different Google properties, as well as meta with Facebook and Instagram and all of that. Well, now Disney's doing the same exact thing. And guess what? This is the you know, canary in the coal mine, or if you will, but that canary's been singing for some time. We should be doing this too. We should be building ecosystems, building. This is the business case for great content marketing, great connected customer experiences in the digital world to build an ecosystem where we can start doing, obviously not at the scale of a Disney. We don't need the scale of a Disney because we're not selling this. We're using it for our own internal marketing purposes. And so the leveraging of owned media in order to drive an ecosystem of experiences where we can leverage all of that first party data is only going to become more valuable for us. And so we can learn, we can absolutely learn the kinds of approaches that they're taking here and not, you know, and really alter our content strategy to not be so siloed so that it's, you know, so that we're not having two separate databases for the blog audience and for our CRM system and for our email database and for the, you know, the sales guy in, you know, Montana who has his own, you know, access database of uh, different contacts and trying to glue all that together with super glue to come up with some sort of insight, getting good, tight, integrated data platforms with our connected content experiences is job number one for us in 2022. So I, I just think this is a great article to express. Well, obviously that. they have all this data and they still want to launch their ad supported Disney plus. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, so you look at that in context with this and you go, well, that's interesting because now they they basically somebody, some like just to your exact point, some accounting person said somewhere, Oh, with all this data that we now have and targeted advertising, we can actually open this up to really open up it. I have, let me be clear. I have no, uh, no doubt that the Disney ad product on Disney plus will be incredible. You'll be able to do targeting versus shows to audience, maybe even down to the individual level, because you'll be able to combine the data that you're getting from Hulu, that you're getting from addressable things, and be able to target that ad. That's amazing. 
the question then becomes, do you really want to do that on Disney Plus? It, it, it really? Because there's so much better data that you could use for Disney Plus to actually have a purity of that data to go to other, you know, other elements that are ad driven, like Hulu and like other anyway, I just got off on another rant here, but but that's the point is that just because you can doesn't mean you should. And we shouldn't go any longer with this podcast. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's it. All right, where are you going? Where what do you got? Uh, yeah, this tilt, week? the tilt coin anniversary. Working on Creator Economy Expo, and uh, what do you got going on? I got, uh, I got. I'm, I'm taking a little bit of a break. I, I've, I've finished CMI University, rendering videos. My little computer is just humming away, rendering video, rendering video, rendering video, and then I'm going to take a little break and go to Good the beach this weekend and just kind of awesome. hang out for a bit. Yeah, perfection. <laughs> All right. All right, folks, we are signing off. Um, We are going to be back again next week. Of course, we will be back again next week. And in the meantime, if you want to get all the goodness of this podcast show notes or dive into the other 300 million shows that are not pie, uh, we just get on over to our website, won't you? Thisoldmarketing.site. Remember, hashtag us up with the Twitter questions and the story ideas. We love those. We will give you a shout out on the show. Hashtag us up at thisoldmarketing. And until we meet again next week, just remember... It's your story to tell. Tell it well. See you next week on This Old Marketing.